All right, welcome to Social Distillation, the submarine still of the internet, where we attempt to drop the bead and pour white lightning straight onto your brain. What are we talking about today, Samo? It is wheel time day, and we have this honker right here, the Towers of Midnight, the second Sanderson book, so he can get Matt wrong again and uh, take us forward. You said we're going to probably get through chapter six. Yeah. Um, when I was reading this morning, so I think I said this when we were done last time, when I was ta- uh, when we were done recording, but I, I'd said that my recollection was that Towers of R- Midnight was really hit or miss. And maybe it was just the frame of mind I was in when I was reading this morning. But when I was rereading this morning, everything was very, eh, it's all right. Eh, whatever. It's okay. I I don't know if if because we were have just been so nitpicky uh over the last several weeks that uh um you know it's like there there's some movies that have come out uh recently that that people are like oh wow this is great and then other people are like no no it, it's not great it's just it's okay it's acceptable and we're used to such giant steaming turds that we have said, <laughs> oh, average, baseline, the minimum you would expect. Good job. Well, and there's also, it, it's, we, we've, we, this reread, we've really torn into Sanderson a lot. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's almost like you didn't get that the first time you read it because I think it had that, uh, that prequel effect like star Wars as a fanboy of the, of the original three, you know, uh, four, five, and six as, as a, uh, as a huge fan of those since childhood, you were so intensely ready for something that you still almost kind of enjoyed that initial movie experience, but then it just kind of sat wrong in your system and you watched it again and you're like, Oh God. Oh uh, oh, eh, no. Mm-hmm. So, and I think that the first read of Sanderson stuff was so, yes, we finally get to, we finally get to see what the ending is that you kind of blow through it and don't pay enough, enough attention to the details because mm-hmm. you're trying to see what Jordan wanted to do to end it. And now that we're meticulously going through it, it's like, ugh, yeah. Ooh, like there's, there's one scene in this prologue that I was just kind of like, yeah. Oh, well, boy. let's let's get into the prologue. The prologue is a number of different point of view shifts. And the first one is with Lan. And I mean, literally, my first n- note is that it's eh instead of meh. So, yay, progress. Well, what what it is, is and, and I'm going to say Jordan is a little bit responsible for this as well. When it comes to the whole Malkir last man standing thing. Mm-hmm. Lan never progressed from New Spring. He, 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 you, you're in book one. You get more old wise man vibes than the whole rest of the series from Lan, mm-hmm. because he really gets into that dark. You know, you, you're just you're you know you're marrying a funeral and all this you know nonsense. And this chapter just kind of continues it. Where the old wise land should be more actually receptive to the fact yes. that oh maybe i do need an army to make a difference and because because a wise man would say it's not about dying for a cause it's about the cause mm-hmm. and yes most likely i'm going to die for the cause but if i go into it blindly and stupidly then i don't affect cause at all it's the old patent it's not about dying for your country it's about making the other poor sap die for his country Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it, 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 at a certain point, it becomes farcical as well. I mean, Lan has to know that the last battle means something like the Trolloc Wars. And, and Lan would know more history, especially about the Trolloc Wars, than the normal person and would know the kind of numbers that are going to be involved. And what are you going to do all by yourself? They call it a horde for a reason. Yeah. Yeah. But but also this is this is actually a contrast between Lan and Rand. Rand got the Lan hardness in his lessons from him. 
and he also got some wisdom. But other than the nihilistic uh, kind of detachment from emotion that we're getting from Rand, he's actually grown up a lot knowing, yes, I'm going to die in the last battle, but I need to make sure as many people get there as possible. Mm -hmm. So he still at least understands that. Otherwise, this hard steel Rand would have just gone up to Shale Ghoul and challenged the Dark One. There are there are elements of this opening that work for me, but uh, a lot of it doesn't, especially as you point out on subsequent rereads where you start to notice more detail now that you've you've gotten the plot out of the way and gotten to the I, I want to I want to hurry up and get to the end. Uh, oh, and then it's a letdown. Oh, <laughs> anyway, um. You expect Rand or not Land to be gruff. He he is a man of few words, but he's he's really a straight up jerk at moments here to this guy to Bulin who shows up here to want to join him. Yeah, if I if I had to paraphrase uh, what a wise Land would have said, it would have been something to the extent of, uh, "You're a young man. I remember you. You were a kid. You're still a young man." With a whole life ahead of you. You sure you want to die? Because that's what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. Yes, I'm Malkyrie. I want to fight it. Okay, well, come on. And, and that was <laughs> the other part that annoyed me was the... Okay, we have seen growth. We have seen times where, where you see that Lan with Nynaeve, Lan plus Nynaeve, they are greater than the sum of the par their parts. The two of them together really grew and are much better both of them are better because they have each other and so to see his him immediately trying to you know straight up thinking how do i weasel out of the oath i gave my wife that clashes with the the, the lines about he wasn't it was sad. very petty it was yeah. very petty because oh she did this so i'm gonna get her back and, and it clashes at this, other, at this poor guy's expense by the way <laughs> with these these other lines he's thinking about how he's not sad that he's going to die but it does hurt him to know what that's going to do to Nynaeve mm -hmm. right and, and and then and then you're immediately being petty about trying to you know weasel out of these oaths the one part that worked and and, and this may be what makes this an end instead of a meh but it would have been so much better if we would have seen more of the you know, he, he is a middle-aged man now, and he has been through a lot, even for someone of his years. If we had seen more of what you were talking about and uh, of, of the kind of land we should have seen here, it would have been more impactful. The one part I like is the, the end of it. Here you have this grown man now, you know, um, he was a boy, a messenger boy when he first met him, so you got to figure... He's and and that was you know the Aiel War so twenty years ago, so you figure he's in his mid thirties maybe. So he's a grown ass man, but tradition is. No, I think we we actually looked at age when we were going through the timelines, and it was like something like forty four or at least like our age. Like Lan, Lan, yeah. No, yeah, yeah. Oh, no, oh, I, oh I, you're I, talking about the boy. Okay, sorry. Yeah, sorry. yeah. So when when last Lan saw him, it was the Aiel War, and he was a messenger uh, boy, Bulin. And so he's, he's, he's probably like in his mid thirties, right? Um, you know, 30 something, but tradition says I can't wear this until my father says that I am a man and I'm worthy. Well, I have no father. Well, I, have no I, mother. I, I got from that conversation, not your father, but someone who was already wearing it. Someone who someone yeah. who has already earned it. Has to, usually, has to it. usually your father. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this this adult man asking for permission that worked. And the fact that that is what ultimately kind of breaks lands walls down. It's just. It still feels kind of petty at the end when he when he says fine, but you know it 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 could have been handled better and with with more nuance to make for a more satisfying 
Um, you know, cause we haven't seen him for, yeah, we didn't see him at all. This Nynaeve is the, kept this bringing is, this him is the up. first Sanderson writing of him. Yeah. Nynaeve kept bringing him up, but we haven't seen him since she dropped him off at world's end at the end of knife of dreams, you know, where, where Jordan left it. So we haven't seen him in a while and it's, Hey, it's land. Awesome. And then it's kind of, eh, okay. You know who did it right and hang with me here? Cause it might seem a little abstract in the beginning. Saving Private Ryan, Tom Hanks' character. He is very much Lan. He's the war veteran, the grizzled guy, the taking care of the young people. And he even has that moment at the end where he's shooting at a tank with a pistol because it's the end. Yeah, But I'm... he did everything in his power to do it the right way along the way. Mm-hmm. And so that it's a similar kind of arc, but they did it right there where, yeah, he did end up in that moment of I'm the last man standing. I'm going to just use the pea shooter I have now to do the job, I guess. But uh, he still led his team. He still yeah. tried to to strategize the the, the battle at the end. And it, it, that that that's kind of a similar arc that did it right. Whereas we kind of lost the plot here uh, with Lan as time went on. And the the really the great moment of that character is that that quiet moment there right before the climactic bat final battle where he's talking to matt damon and they're they're sharing that moment Mm -hmm. uh and and he gives him that kind of fatherly mentor advice of no you need a you know you think about it in context and then you know, then those memories are still with you. And that's how you keep your brothers alive and, and having that moment. But then that's why I think it is a great uh, uh, comparison because then when, when Matt Damon turns to him and says, you know, tell me about your wife and, and the roses and nope, that memory is all mine. And then uh, that's all he <laughs> says about it. Yeah. Well, and, and, uh, but so with Lan, the way this first couple of pages, first basically page, if you add it up, mm-hmm. uh, with with Lan and the uh, the kid, the the younger guy. This was Lan before Nynaeve. Yeah. So this this was Lan in the beginning in in New Spring. Then he had Moraine, and now he had purpose again. And he knew he had this this overall purpose, but he was doing it the right way. Moraine dies, or Moraine goes away. Then we get this Lan again, and then Nynaeve even though she had been in the picture is now back in the picture and we get new land Mm -hmm. land. That's got purpose again. And that was, I think the whole, I think that was the arc Jordan was going for nihilist gets purpose, loses that purpose, finds purpose again in someone else in a completely different way, way that, that just blindsides him. And then that was what was going to shift him to being the leader he needed to be. We didn't get that. What we got here is, oh, she manipulated me. Mm-hmm. Not I. I learned and I grew as a person because of her. We get that she grew as a person because of him, because Jordan did a lot of that mm-hmm. going up to these books. But this is our first land since Jordan, and basically at this point, if you're talking about land as a as a a string a line in the story, Nynaeve has no purpose here. We get one fleeting thought, oh, that pained him that she's going to have to lose, you know, that he's going to die. But he he is he is he is land from the beginning of New Spring again. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And he he rather than rather than talking as much as he did, he he really he should have a lot more of that probably should have been internal dialogue of him wrestling with the two halves of himself the 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 fatalistic nihilistic part of him the old him and the new him that is you know I'm, yeah but i don't I'm even think the man the nihilist, i was before i married an eve i don't even think the nihilist should be there yeah at this point because of that relationship it, it, this this became a manipulative game instead of her presence yeah. supplying purpose it's a good point all right and you know, then if, as if that weren't enough, then we shift to pairing. We, we have one, <laughs> one, we go from one character regression to another, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so, so the, the scene, it, 
itself works. It just, again, this is one of those, so much with Perrin really since Dumai as well. You know, that's really kind of yeah. where Perrin's character ends for me. Is, and, and, is Well, and this is, this is, this is Sanderson as a storyteller trying to just check the boxes of telling a story. Whereas we just came from Jordan, who realistically, let's say he's the philosopher. Yeah. There, there is a duality to Perrin that was, that is a central theme. It, 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 it's the, it's the, it's the how much, uh, it, 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 we talked about this in our, in our automaton episode where if you meditate a lot, you can basically turn off your default mode network, which is the thing that overthinks everything, but it also adds context to everything. But then you lose sight of basically your senses to some degree. Well, there's balance. And Perrin mm -hmm. is supposed to represent somebody trying to find that balance. Yes. And the balance is the wolf and the blacksmith. The blacksmith makes things the way they should be. Yes. The wolf lives freely. And that's you could see that's what's supposed to be happening here. It's just you don't mm -hmm. get that, you don't get that underlying uh feeling from it sanderson is pop music you get the beat but you don't get the feeling yeah yeah it's right there on page 23 where where hopper says to him always it is a thing of men to you what of things of wolves and paired response i am not a wolf a wolf except you kind of are and yeah and i mean hopper should have said you wouldn't be here if you weren't we wouldn't we be get... having this conversation if you weren't how yes. dumb can you be? We would not be talking if you weren't. And we get more of that later. The really the most interesting thing to me about this scene is it is it that um metaphysically, mechanically, the mechanics of the of of the established world don't make sense to me here because Perrin thinks somehow he recognizes that this isn't a regular dream. But he says he it's also not the world of dreams. Mm -hmm. And he doesn't know how he knows that, but he knows that, which means this is this is is this parent the dream. We know Perrin can see dreams in much it's similar to Egwene, but only when he's inside the world of dreams. This make it makes it seem like Perrin actually has the ability to be a dreamer with a capital D. Mm-hmm. But the other odd thing here is that at the end on page 24. Well, but no, there has to be some crossover to it because Hopper can't be there in his regular dream. Exactly. That yeah. was my, wait a minute. So it's not but a regular we do dream, get instances but it's not earlier. the world of dreams. We do get instances earlier where people drag their dreams into the world of dreams. So he might be in that state. Yeah, I, that, that was my big, my big, wait, what is, is that really Hopper? And if that's, the actual hopper then how is he there if it's not the world of dreams mm -hmm. no i think it's the world of dreams but he is so out of control of it that yeah. it's basically dragging his dream into the world of dreams like like when uh in the tower all the trollocks were cooking the the Aes Sedai as they were learning because they dragged a dream into they dragged a nightmare into the world of dreams yeah that wasn't a bubble of evil that was a dragged nightmare and then they kept perpetuating it by staying afraid when the answer was to deny the dream. He's yeah. semi denying the dream, but he's still going through the motions. So I think he, I think that's the state they're in again, it's written differently. So you kind of have to really pull from the source material from before to kind of come to that conclusion. I think. Um, Which again, I wonder if the uh, new writer actually even understood what was purpose of some of these things in the original writing yeah yeah or dreams a dream maybe to sanderson there's no differentiation between the world of dreams and actual dreams that you know that that actually may explain a lot of my dissatisfaction with a lot of stuff that's going to happen here in this book and in the last book but you mean there is no uh, with regard to the world of dreams <laughs> yeah and and how it it just it didn't work for me um and it may be his in a sanderson's inability to 
hold those two seemingly contradictory thoughts in his head at the same time like jordan well, like i said he is a writer he is a storyteller but i don't think he understands the themes the deep thoughts yes. that jordan would have behind what he was writing i think i think jordan wanted he wanted he wanted to hit notes that brought people in in a way that they may not even understand but they're like god that just means a lot to me yeah and we got a story told at the end without the inflection tom talks about it in book three or whatever when he's with with matt all the time how he tells the story how this guy can tell the same story but he doesn't do it the way i do it yeah 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 he doesn't make you feel like you're there um uh, and then we switch to grendel and we get that's why i wore this shirt <laughs> and i put up end of gender uh, just because of Aaron gar too so <laughs> Well, it is. It's. But it's you know, I was thinking about he, it. I was really thinking about her. it. I'm, I'm still hot, hot for Aaron Gar, and she technically is a biological woman, so it's not gay. <laughs> um, I mean, if you want to say something, she's a trans man because she's a woman biologically with the mind of a man, right? I don't know how that works and we're already canceled. So let's just move on. <laughs> uh, I don't, I don't really have any thoughts. I have more thoughts about Grendel later uh, when we get, a, when we get another point of view from her. Um, I think it's in chapter five. Yeah. So I, I have some more thoughts about Grendel uh, when we get another uh, point of view of her. Do you have any thoughts about this, this scene specifically? No, I had forgotten about it when we, were originally doing the reread that she did survive this mm -hmm. and I'd forgotten how she got around the compulsion thing. And so that was kind of more of just a refresher for me. Uh, I, I, he, you know, he actually did write uh, pretty well her, her annoyances and it's, it's a little thing, but he did it well. So I'm going to give credit since we just pooped on him a little bit, mm -hmm. the annoyances with trying to be a bird. <laughs> trying to see like a bird trying to hear like a bird like i'm not even going to try the flying thing because it's harder than you think it's uh yeah that part was that part was pretty cool i i and i did like her thought processes you know he did a pretty good job of showing her train of thought so you could see not just how smart she is but why she's so smart mm -hmm. you know how she's able to be I so thought, manipulative i thought Aaron gar was was uh caricatured in this but and, and 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 if he did it through grendel's point of view he didn't do a good enough job of saying this is how i think of her versus how she actually is he mm -hmm. actually made it seem like grendel knew her well enough to say knew bethamel well enough to say this is how he was and this is this is how dumb he is and all these things and i'm like he wouldn't be one of the forsaken if he's dumb sorry uh, well there, there are two things to that one um Oh, geez, you just sent me down a rabbit hole. And now we're definitely getting canceled. Okay. Why, why is why is James Bond impressive and sexy? Because it is hard for a man to be that charismatic and that seductive. That takes work. That takes skill. Why will a female Bond not work? Because that's just a slut. Why? Oh, that's sexist. No, that's a fact. Because it's not hard for a woman to be seductive. All you have to do is say yes. Well, we have a female bond. It's Poison Ivy when she was, or uh, Black Widow when she was done well. When she was done well, yeah. yeah when she was done well, yeah. But that's that's different. That, that, there but you, you notice, you notice the female difference. bonds never put out; they just seduce. There you go. There's the difference. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Um. So anyway, go back to one of our many episodes previous about the difference in mate value and all the biological blah, 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 overlapping bell curves, all the standard disclaimers. So way back in whichever book it was where where we get. Um, Grendel's point of view at one of these forsaken gatherings, and and, and that's really where we're. Uh, Jordan confirmed what we all already had figured out, which was that Arangar is Bethamel, 
and Grendel is thinking about the change because of the change in body and that his now well, her yeah, because he was a lecherous historian it, and it, now exactly. he's a girl <laughs> exactly that, that yeah. that's the point i'm getting at is that grendel commented then that it seemed like his now her appetites had gotten worse and i hadn't really thought about it before but no that would make sense if you're the the lecherous you know um weeb living down in his mom's basement and now you're the hottest chick in any room you walk into you know the hottest person just take the gender out of you're the hottest person yeah, that everybody like, wants it's like someone who wants to kill people versus the person who wants to kill people and you give them a minigun <laughs> right <laughs> so so it is possible that the transmigrating of this soul into this body would enhance those appetites and kind of send Bethamel over the deep end in that regard but you do get a little note that Bethamel's not that far gone and because there is that moment where Grendel thinks crap I shouldn't have sent in the extras in to distract him that 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 cued Arangar in that something was up Mm -hmm. Because Rondar comes in and says, hey, what's going on? When when Grendel was trying to wanted to figure it out and make a plan first. Yeah, the the I do have a problem with and this is something that even Jordan did is the convenient power. Uh she switched back to say Sidon mm -hmm. or Sidar, excuse me, the female. And she immediately shielded a very strong Aes Sedai, which she should be able to do as a Forsaken. But also a Forsaken who was a male Forsaken and stronger than her with the power. Surprise is one thing, but we, we he would have gotten the tingle. He, she would have gotten the tingle and all of that to know something was up, to at well, least be embracing the source. Actually, to me, the bigger uh, plot hole in this scene for me is actually when Arangar gets distracted by the power because Arangar can feel how much power Rand is drawing. Doesn't know why, because Grendel's the one who actually saw the, the code and call key. But the fact that, that Arangar is like um, transfixed rather than terrified mm -hmm. because. Uh, well, especially since she's bit, she was there for the, the Shadar Logoth cleansing she knows she she would have said this is I yes. haven't felt this since that oh, day. Yes. Oh crap. Yeah. 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 There should th that should have been an oh crap. We need to get out of here moment. That to that's me why I said she should have at least been holding bottle. the power, which would have made it impossible to shield her. At yeah. That moment. Yeah. And, and if there if if there would have been just the fleeting thought of uh, from Grendel of I need to get a shield up before Arangar uh, grabs hold of the power. Or, or something to that effect um because we have seen before and I, I think i think it's from i think lanfear and asmodine both have kind of said things along these lines uh or maybe it was loose theron in, in Rand's head when he was trying to figure out how to get out of the box and get out of the shields that um yes if you know what you're doing a more powerful channeler can push through can break a shield that's actively being held but it's harder and mm -hmm. it takes longer even with a significant difference in power dynamic once the shield is already established if you're holding the power we already know it's much harder to get that shield in place unless you are significantly more powerful so it, if neither one of them are holding the power and all you need is to block you know block the power for just a second that that part isn't problematic to me. The bigger problem is why is Arangar so dumb, so transfixed by the ooh, look at the pretty light, rather than holy crap, what is going on? We need to get out of here. So there, 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 there should have been a, some extra element there of distraction. Mm -hmm to allow Grendel to um, 
trap them there and so that she could get away. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, and then we move on to Galad, which I find um, interesting and amusing. The but prettiest go, lady to Grand the prettiest Bilder, man. Yeah. 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 Um, you know, you know, Spotify did me a dirty today. Who? Uh, we were, had kind of a 90s, 80s, 90s rock mix going, and Hole came on, Courtney Love. <laughs> and then right afterwards, a Nirvana song came on. I was like, that's wrong, Spotify. That's wrong. Because Why you she, do that? He's the female OJ. Come on. <laughs> we all know it. We all know it. I know it's a conspiracy theory that Kurt Cobain didn't kill himself, but it was just too much going on there. He was divorcing her and taking everything and the kids, and all of a sudden he's dead. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sorry, mm -hmm. that's my 90s rock me getting in there. and That was wrong, Spotify. Wrong. They shouldn't even be in the same playlist. Uh, speaking of not being in the same playlist, this Galad scene was interesting to me because something that jumped out at me and i think because we brought this up before is that you know yeah Gawain sucks but the more i think about it the more i think he's supposed to and that that Gawlet is the true hero and it was a it was an inversion a subversion a flip of expectations by jordan because when you first meet Gawlet, you're not supposed to like him mm -hmm. and yet when we finally do get points of view of him you know what that Elaine, you're you're wrong. You, you're kind of a B here. It, he, he's not he's not a bad guy. You know what? He you know, yeah, he's the kind of friend who would be hard to be friends with, but he's still a good guy. You know, he, it's actually a common trope if you really think about it. Think of like a, a, a movie coming to my head is School of Rock with Jack Black. You've always got that that character that's the 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 broomstick up their ass kid in the school mm -hmm. movies and then they do something cool at the end and everybody like loves them that's Gallad. he's the broomstick up the ass guy that yeah. all of a sudden kind of comes around and is like yeah, okay i'll help you with this one you know it's for the greater good even though it doesn't follow the rules you know that that's and, and everybody likes that character at the end and we kind of got that with Gallad. this is the like mm -hmm. the meta version of that well now what i didn't like is we talked about this in one of the last book episodes where he Sanderson wrote a speech for one of his people. I think it was a Wayne. Yeah. And I'm yeah, like, he's so. just not a great speech writer. I think he thinks he's a good speech writer because this speech from Gallad to his troops, I'm like, mm -hmm. God, this is such a you, trope. It's you, you, you think you're doing the, uh, the climactic speech by the president and independence day. And it's not, you're just not, you're not there yet, man. Yeah. Yeah. It's, this is not tear down this wall. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall and everybody cheers. But other um, than that, I do like the the betrayal. I do like the way things kind of played out. Well, I'll tell you what what I liked, what jumped out at me. Page 38, right at the top there. He's thinking about Althor. And think, you know. It's the, the anti-Gawain. -Ga yeah. Exactly. And that's where I made the Gawain comparison is, is Galad, the guy who is supposed to be rigidly black and white, and yet the reason he becomes so likable is when we get inside his head, we see that, oh no, he, he's actually a deep thinker. He he acts rigidly black and white, but not until he thinks through where the line is and why. Well, yeah, and in this one paragraph at the top of that page, he kind of goes through the entire thought process that you've you spent what was this book 13 the 12 books talking about with what makes the dragon reborn so special is that he is the savior at the same time he's the destroyer mm -hmm. and Gallad's going through that exact thought process in just one paragraph well he he's the dragon he's supposed to destroy the world it's a bad thing but he's also supposed to save the world so we got to make sure it happens i don't know how it happens but we 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 should at least facilitate him fighting in the last battle i think mm -hmm. and Yep, the he, Galad, the the bad brother, is his feelings towards Althor are much more nuanced and mature than Gawain's, and we're gonna see that in a little bit when we actually get a little bit of a Gawain point of view, and he's still being Gawain. Um, another another bit to that of the, you know, he actually is a deep thinker. Is there's this moment where he's going back and forth with, um, some of the. 
is it with is it when they meet Asanawa? Yes. Yeah, with the other yeah. wars captain. So yeah, um where uh da, 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 da. so this is page forty two. The last battle comes, Asanawa. We haven't time for squabbling. The dragon reborn walks the land. Heresy, Asanawa said. Yes, Gallet said, and truth as well. There's some deep thoughts there, man. <laughs> and it, it ties back to where we were on page 38, where he's Which, you thinking know, through I, this paradox. I know it would add words to the pages where there's a lots of words already, but I wish we would have gotten more uh, excerpts from the, uh, the, what do they call it, the Book of Light? Yeah, I think so. The Children so. of Light's Bible? Because mm -hmm. they have to have a prophet. Because we talk about the dark prophecies, we talk about the Corinthian cycle, we talk about the Shanchan prophecies, we talk about the Koromor prophecies, we talk about the Aiel prophecies. We don't really have a good insight of what the last battle is supposed to look like for mm -hmm. the children of light. Galad is telling us what he thinks it should be, but yeah. apparently Asunawa thinks it's something completely different. And I, I don't know if, if it's a spoiler, to, we'll save it for the end, but. To my knowledge, I don't remember Asunawa ever being a dark friend. So I think he was just a zealot. Yeah. 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 Um He he was human corruption in the children of light versus mm -hmm. actually being a dark friend and trying to dismantle everything. Uh if it, it if I'm wrong, then it's a spoiler and we'll find out some other day. But I don't remember anything no. like that happening. Yeah. No, so far as we know, we never. And Asanawa is going to be dead here in a couple of chapters, anyway. Yeah, but so, but that that that's why I'm saying we we don't know what the Book of Light says about the last battle because we could have a passage that would let us that would be vague enough to say, well, Galad could be right or Asanawa could be right. Yeah, if we read they, it this way or that way. They they figure so prominently, and we only ever see a couple of, or of excerpts that when people quote it. It, it, that's a good point that it would have been nice if, if Jordan would have given us a little bit more there from time to time when we were in white cloak um, chapters, you know, with when, when white cloaks are speaking, have a few more of them drop some lines, you know, drop some quotes from their Bible so that we would have a little bit of more of a picture and a little bit more or, that we can Or even here on. when Gallat is reflecting on why they need to go face the last battle he, he could have been thinking of a quote in his head yeah you yeah. know such and such marches with under the banner of blah 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 da, 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 da. and it could be super vague like all the Falm quotes that we know to be that we know how they manifested but they were really mm -hmm. vague before you saw it and it it could have been something like that and we'll be like ooh, well you know what Gallad, you're may mostly right but that actually is you know land at the tarwin's gap you know yeah <laughs> Yeah. Uh, then we get a couple of pages with Pad and Fane, which I thought it was fine. I thought it was, you know, appropriately written in the appropriate length of, all right, we just need a couple of pages to reintroduce us to this guy. What's going on? Yeah, he's been absent for what, three books? Yeah, set, set up that he's going to be around and doing something during the last battle. So, all right, that's fine. Um, the last bit I thought was the best bit of the prologue. Um, in large part, I guess, kind of, you know, it's the, uh, I never could be a pickup artist because I could never figure out how to do the insult compliment. But here I just did. Um, his, uh, this is the best bit because it's, it's not pre-existing characters. So Sanderson <laughs> doesn't have anyone to screw up. So maybe that's why it's, it's so good and it stands out. But um, it's a good moment. Uh, especially page 50, 51, uh, where, um, where the father, uh, his name I can't remember, uh, Milanarin, yeah, uh, and his son Keemlin, who's he gives him his sword a few days early, um, and, and, you know, the son says, but it's, it's not my name day yet. It's still a few days away, and his father basically says that's not the point. It's it's not the it's not the birth date that makes you a man, mm -hmm. right? It's no you, I I don't see a boy here. I see a man standing before me because of what he does, the actions he takes, the um, the ability the ability to think 
in a way that a man needs to think and then act on it. I think I think that's the the two things there are why these two pages, page 50 and 51, stand out so much is that you had the foresight to think through, you know what? This kid who's who's below me on the roster, he's lighter and 10 pounds can make all the difference when you need when you need a horse to gallop it at full speed to get away from Trollocs. Um, and he's the last son of his mother. All, all his all his older brothers have already died to the blight. So there's there's no one left for his mother. Um, where it, w w the the implication being, I'm not an only son. You have other sons. So if I die here, it's it's not the same as if he dies here. Mm -hmm. And then to act on it. So you had that thought, and then you said you take my place because of this. And and that's you know that's that's why we <laughs> that's what I think we ended up spending what thirty minutes on a three minute song when we we when we finally oh, finished yeah, with that episode yeah. of no, what it means to be a man. Forty five minutes. Forty five minutes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Which is why I thought it was dumb that it took so long to get past all the copyright crap. Is we it's a 45 minute video on a three minute song clearly it's an analysis and not trying yeah. to just use the song for it <laughs> yeah uh oh are you there heath all right sorry for the hiccup there i have no idea where he was in his thoughts and he doesn't either because he doesn't know when he stopped so because i'm old and confused yeah yeah um no, I, I think that that was it. This is, is. why I don't trust self-driving cars. By the way, we can't even <laughs> if we can't even get a good Wi-Fi signal in the freaking suburbs. I'm not going to trust the thing to have a signal that connecting yeah. to other cars and you know knowing that there's something in the road in front of me and yeah. eventually yeah. they will be better than everything else. But I don't think we're there yet. No, we're not there yet. Yeah. Uh speaking of not being there yet, um. Chapter one. Um, yeah, I, I teased as, as the as the meme, but I had to save it because I forgot the apples were the beginning of this book and not the the end of the last one. Yeah. Uh, I don't remember how I felt about this chapter the first time I read it, and now it's kind of dumb and cheesy to me for a couple of reasons first of all i don't know how i keep forgetting that um the old guy that we're getting the point of view from here we've we met back in the eye of the world which <sighs> all right i i understand the whole age lace the pattern etc and so forth but at some point, the the coincidences start to become contrivances and become a little silly. Maybe it was just the way Sanderson wrote it. But, you know, the 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 reveal that for anyone who didn't remember the name, that this is the this is the farmer um, who gave Matt and Rand a ride to Camelin. Um that's a heck of a kawinky dink for one and for two. I also, I'm not sure how to feel about this miracle because all the other ones we see and Rand makes the point or someone makes the point. It's not impossible. It's just highly improbable. And it just happened mm -hmm. to happen. But this, this one is, is not impossible. an improbability. Yeah. This is an impossibility. The, the, uh, apple trees don't bloom twice. And they certainly don't ripen their fruit in a day. So I feel like we needed something more here. And I'm I'm curious where this chapter came from. You know, was this something from the notes or was this Sanderson's invention? Okay, so uh, there is something similar to it. And we could have maybe gotten a better connection. I'm and I'm kind of spitballing here because it may not have been the point but if it was the point there might have been a way to do it I'm, I'm not a writer so don't get me to write it out for you but let me throw the the bullet points we see this in the 
pillars in Rydian with the Ogier and the original Ale, Aeol, singing oh. to the orchards and the and the farms and everything bursting and the, out and growing. The green so man. Tree, tree singing, the green man, all of that. I had not made that connection. That's a good point. That, I think, is where this was supposed to come from. Because Rand is Aeol. Yeah. And he's connected to the true source and all of these things. And he's the dragon reborn connected to the land. He, we, we, uh, you know, we, there, there, there maybe should have been something to pull those together, but this is like the, the, the 10th time we've read these books. So I was able to pull things together, but yeah, we do yeah. see that we do see that in the green man and the Aeol and the Algier all working together. So we might've needed a chapter where he's recruiting Ogier or something and saying, this is where this is where I thought the song was supposed to go. Mm -hmm. This is where the 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 tinker should have been involved. I thought this is where the song was supposed to go because they remembered the song that was being sung to bring life, or they were supposed to remember and they had forgotten. Mm -hmm. And that's what I think this is. But it's what a four page chapter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, four pages. Five. One, two, three, four, five. And and we're getting, you know, in the next chapter, chapter two, we get more of what is a growing concern, which is food spoiling, that no one has enough to eat. Everybody is going hungry. Uh, well, and and there is the counter to that, because you said it's something that's an impossibility. The food spoiling all at once in a matter of of of, of hours. That's a good point. is also an impossibility. So, um. Except where it's protected by the Tavarin, who are bubbles of order, basically bubbles of the pattern. And so parent parents are sponsored. Rand was, to... Rand was in uh Bander Eben when all of that spoiled. Because he'd gone dark. Because he'd done yeah, he did the dirty. And, and and so that was that was after his turn. So in chapter two here, when these when these cell swords, these guys joining up with Perrin say, you really do have food and it, it doesn't spoil if it's let, you know, and, and Perrin's confused. No, of course not. You just you, you, you take the normal precautions that you do to preserve food and then you have food, except that's not the way it's working with with everybody else is that no, even with the normal precautions, the food is still spoiling. So, yeah, that's a good point. Um, but where I was going with that was no wonder um, Matt doesn't have problems. He's the only one not overthinking things right now. <laughs> um, I, I was always of the opinion that the song was never going to be refound, that that was one of those things that was lost and it, it's a new age. There are going to be new things. So I, I was always of the opinions and I'd made comments in, in discussing with fellow nerds or in posting on the message boards that, you know, no, I don't think the th song is going to be rediscovered. But here at the end, I start. I I had a bit of a rethink of well, maybe because of all the the food spoilage. I I there was a thought of well, yeah, maybe the song, maybe you know, Rand or someone, you know, or or he'll be the spark that leads to someone refinding the song so that they can counteract the spoilage of the dark one because everyone is literally starving and there's not enough food to go around. You know what? The the moment on the mountain was okay, but he should have spent time with the tinkers in the way Perrin did and Egwene. That's a good point. He did, that, that but Sanderson was... brushed over it. No, because remember, he, he spent the night because the gates of the city were closed at sunset and they didn't open again until sunrise. And so he spent the night outside of uh, of Ibu Dar with a, in a tinker camp and he traded his fancy cloak for a plain brown one. OK, so, yeah, it was. It, OK, so I, th I have a feeling Jordan was uh, was making that a big deal and Sanderson glossed over it because he missed the plot. It, the, it, it should have been, like I said, the song, it should have been him 
drinking in that peace loving living life to its fullest kind of mentality and then letting that soften him a little bit but instead he he spent the night there and then he went and basically beat himself up on a hilltop mm -hmm. that's a good point i hadn't thought about that should have been a bigger deal is that because there is a there is a thought there i remember he does have a thought of that that's part of his his conflict when he's going to destroy Ibu Dar is, but even the Tinkers are safe. The Tinkers are so safe here that they're becoming sedentary, which is contrary to everything a Tinker is. He does have that thought. That should have been a bigger deal, and it would have been a bigger deal if we actually would have seen him in the Tinker camp rather than just have him think about how he spent the night at a Tinker camp. Mm -hmm. That, that, that yeah, would have oh, been a better progression. I, I really think we just found something that is probably in the notes, but Sanderson just completely mm -hmm. fumbled. Mm -hmm. um, the apples should have been the song. Which you see him trying to pull Loyal back in with his little quote at the beginning. Then, you know, the excerpt from the Dragon Reborn by Loyal talking about his own time at the stump. I, I, again, I think there's a, there might have been a lot of notes for that, and he didn't know what to do with it. Mm. I, you know what? I hadn't even... I completely forgot about that. We weren't supposed to start at the prologue. We were supposed to start before the prologue. Uh, rather than a prophecy, we have an excerpt from The Dragon Reborn by Loyal, son of Arnt, son of Holland of Steading Changtai. And this always struck me as wrong. And now I suspect it's because Sanderson wrote it, not RJ. But Sanderson wrote it from notes of Jordan's. Mm -hmm. And that Jordan didn't actually write this excerpt because this doesn't sound like Loyal. In large part because it's too much about him mm -hmm. rather than I just happen to be there. Lo lo loyal is very humble and he is not concerned with his own um, yeah, prestige, it, if you will. He's more concerned about. If we were to take the uh, loyal, event. we we knew from earlier in the Jordan writings, this would have been in the book that he wrote, but it would have been the stump met and there was much deliberating and this happened mm -hmm. because he did, he would not have put his own part in it. He wouldn't have talked about, I needed to do this. I needed to do the, the word. Yes. I wouldn't be used. There's it's not just that there's way too much. I it's that it, it, that it builds to a point, these three short paragraphs here build to a point, And the last one is basically saying, I knew the fate of the world was on my shoulder and I had to find the, you know, I had to rally everybody. He would be way more um, dismissive of his own part. Like I said, he, 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 would have thought, he, would have, it, but... he would have talked of it in the third person. The stump convened and there were arguments on both sides. And uh... mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Um, uh, your humble writer spoke. And and presented these thoughts. I don't even think he stump. would have. I don't even yeah. think he would have brought that up. I think yeah. he would have just said that it happened, and there were arguments on both sides. Maybe even named the people on the other side, and you know. But this prevailed. Well, you, know? you know, actually, yes. The la the last speaker said these things, and then you get and then you get to the end, and you see, oh, loyal wrote this. He, we, the reader knows that that was him but loyal's not going to put that in himself well, he, he I, would, i've would spoken just be to my like own speaker. analysis yeah. of, of the of the writer of that and he yeah. the writer of that would have said i did this and i did that and i had mm -hmm. to do this while i'm signing autographs the whole time that's a good point that's a good point um so that sidetracked me about oh yeah uh chapter two um 
I, I kind of defended Sanderson and Perrin in the in the previous book because I thought he was trying to um, rehabilitate Perrin, so to speak, of, you know, we, we, we've we've kind of talked and meandered and wondered about what was what was the point that Jordan was trying to achieve here? And I thought that um, Sanderson was very was trying to very quickly say, okay, yes, and now let's move on. But then we immediately go backwards again. So I don't know how much of this is on Jordan, how much of this is on Sanderson, because, I mean, as much as we love him, Jordan was responsible for the slog, as it has now become known and will you know forever be in canon uh, that it is the slog. And that to me is, is page 67 because we're right back to it of, mm -hmm. you know, this is all going to end. I'm going to send everyone back where they belong because a man's got to see a thing for what it is. No sense in calling a buckle a hinge or calling a nail a horseshoe. I've told you I'm not a good leader. I proved that. Um, you know, it, it, it's one thing for him to think that. It's one thing for him to confide that with his wife. But to be so adamant and forceful and trying to make it happen, that's just, it's boring at this point. It is incredibly boring uh, because we keep retreading the same ground. And it, he's, be, he's being very Elaine here. You know, our, our frustration with Elaine is that she's, constantly uh being humiliated but never being humbled mm -hmm. never learning her lesson well that's what's happening with how, how many times does Fail have to point out to you you know not just that you're wrong but how you're wrong i mean she she makes the point well hold on you're being very randish here perrin uh <laughs> that you're you're you, you refuse to see the half full part of the glass and that's Fayel's job here is to point out to her husband, well, wait a minute, I've talked to these people and they all tell a very different story that you held everyone together when it looked like things were about going to spiral out of control. You kept everything together. You kept everything, everyone focused, and you came up with the plan at the end that, of what was needed to get the job done and rescue everybody. Well, and that's where perspective comes in because we have his thoughts and we know how selfish he was being when his followers just yeah. know he was taking charge. Yeah. And, and that's why I say um, the the parents' frustration, his doubts, these are all very perfectly valid and human and fine character moments. It's what gets annoying is, is here in a little bit when he orders the wolf flag to be bur burnt and we're you know so this is where we're, this is kind of where we're headed to where we're going to end at the end of chapter six and it's oh and we're right back to the grind we're right back to the boring grind and it it, it just it's it, well it's, it's counterproductive and it's spinning its wheels this is this is okay so we're feeling the frustration that this personality type feels Mm -hmm. they try to control everything around them. And that's frustrating because life is random to some degree. Yeah, no, you, it you, makes you control sense. the controllable, but at the same time, there yes. is, a, there is randomness to life. And that's the whole point of the, the wolf and the blacksmith. They, they did it in the prologue. He yes. is forming metal. That is He's all trying about to control. That force is, it. Yes. Yeah. And, the wolf is there to say, be free sometimes. He, you know, pa Perrin is line. a perfectionist and he's trying to force order because when you are, when you are the blacksmith, you're controlling all the variables. You have Perrin, controlled all the variables. You can't Perrin do is that Freud's life. overbearing mother. Mm. They drive themselves crazy trying to control everything about the life of this person, including their themselves. Mm -hmm. And it's it's extremely anxiety ridden it is self-defeating and it destroys you it stresses you the fuck out mm -hmm. and parent is that the wolf is the part that says dude let go yeah have some shrooms yeah. man and they you know it's it's get through this and parent is the embodiment of that 
and they're, we they're... keep going back to it, which, okay, so this, this is where I'm going to give Sanderson some slack because Jordan set it up is that duality is very quickly resolved with the wolf story in a long story. So I don't know. It, it, he it, at some point you he probably had to make the decision of do I draw this out, or do I have it resolve and hit him be a very stable character from here on out? Mm -hmm. And I think he made the decision of no, we're going to still have him be tormented by this duality. Yeah, and I think because he wanted it to climax with something that's going to happen later. Uh, so I won't say it right now, but I think he wanted to climax with something. And so he had to draw it out. Whereas with Matt, until Sanderson got a hold of it, uh, we had basically resolution in his own internal state mm. early on. And then he was going with the flow. He he was the new Matt. He was the the adult Matt for the rest of up until the end of Knife of Dreams. Uh, the most interesting part to me about chapter two is, you know, that the end of it, it switches back to Gallad's point of view, which is perfect. And it, it, you know, just kind of jumped out at me that, yeah, it was a slog to get there, but it is appropriate that parents' story comes full circle because, because where was the moment of crisis for Perrin it wasn't the fleeing the two rivers. It was when he first had took a life mm -hmm. and, and he felt like he lost control in doing it. And it was with white cloaks. He killed white cloaks. And now his story is coming full circle as he's coming back around to the white cloaks. And, and we, we see them headed towards each other um, more so here in a, in a couple of chapters. Um, but, but, but Gallad is, is, is also the proper person for this to happen because it, it just kind of dawned on me that the, it's a bit of a paradox because they're seemingly different, but Gallon and Perrin are incredibly similar characters. They're incredibly no, similar. No, no. Let, let me, let me push back a little bit on that because it's going to, it is going to sound paradoxical, but Gallon is the wolf. He certainly he is when he's fighting. No, no, he is the wolf in his mentality. We we think of Gallad, we think of order because of what's right. Mm -hmm. Notice when we get in his head, what's right is a rational evaluation every time a situation comes that's, up. Yeah, that's a good point. He evaluates everything on the merit, which is just like the wolf in the wild. It doesn't matter what you think things should be. It's what it, what's happening right now and what is right. Even even his interaction with the other captain's commander that are freeing him here that he forbade from coming after him and helping him, he his initial thought is, well, you know what? Maybe they are right. I don't know. Let me think about this for a second. That is more the wolf. Well, er earlier when when uh, when he discovers that this one of the scouts had betrayed him and led them into this trap, and and buyer is. He yeah, can hear he, Bayer his, drawing his swords, and he says, no, don't. He, this guy did what he thought was right, and you killing him isn't going to change anything, so page stop. sixty, Page 69 here, even he's reflecting on that. Gallad felt no anger at the scouts who had betrayed him. The questioners were a valid source of authority in the children. So he, he's, he's got that mentality of, I would have done the same thing if I was that person at that exact time. But, but he, here, here, here was where the, the, uh, the disconnect is is because Perrin's not there yet because what what that made me think of was here in a couple of chapters when Perrin is with Hopper in the wolf dream and they're hunting and Perrin goes too far he doesn't understand what Hopper is teaching him is there is you think you think that you're being too wild you think you're embracing the wolf but all the rest of us we knew when the hunt was ended and you almost killed killed that mm -hmm. stag okay that that wasn't us that was you bro and 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 that's a good that's a good point because Gallad is where Perrin needs to be but and and he's just there naturally Perrin's trying to figure out how to get there mm -hmm. um yeah early Gal Gallad that was the, the the broomstick up the ass Gallad 
he was he was governed by a set of rules. But Galad that developed is the Galad that evaluates every situation and what is right. Well, right is what's best for most people. Mm -hmm. And okay, so what is right? We go to the last battle as the children because we are, are a, an elite fighting force and we are going to be fighting on the side of good. That's right. That's an evaluative stance. It's not because the children, the book of the children of the light said that we will march to this place and do this. No, that's where Perrin is because, well, we have to fit a square peg in a round hole. Yes. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, All right. Chapter three. Uh, Egwene. Um, let, let me take a... Good. All right, so how interested in, are you in talking about Egwene's dreams? Um, because so two of them we know basically because um, in a second when she talks to Rand, she's going to realize that that's what the dream of Rand was was him breaking the seals. Mm -hmm. Um. Which is a little bit of a, okay, but then why are you still so adamantly opposed to him? Because you're dreaming. The dream seems to imply that he needs to do this. Mm -hmm. So there's one. Well, um, she's also, well, I, I think maybe it's me and maybe Scott's the same way I am, but annoying characters are the characters that think of things as they should be and not as they are. And Egwene still holds on to that a lot. That's a good point. The one about the towers was the one that struck me as interesting. And I'm wondering, are we supposed to get this? Is this some kind of a red herring? Or is this just giving us a glimpse of what will come to pass when the series is over? Because I feel like there are a lot of hints of things of, of you know we're not going to get perfect resolutions much like I long thought that, you know, we, the song wouldn't be found again. Cause that was something of the last age and the wheel of time turns and moves on and, you know, and Jordan. And so not only is that in the schema, in the philosophy of the, of the world. Yeah. I but thought, that about, I thought that about the, so the song till we re reanalyze the apples, but <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, uh, Jordan had said as much as, as not everything's going to be resolved because that's not how life works. Um, where there are certain things that we're not going to know because the characters in the book aren't going to know them. They won't know, you know, who did what or what happened to who or you know how how something transpired. And, and then same thing with with moving on, what comes after. You know, some of it's going to be up in the air. And so, my assumption. Because remember the opening wind went through Sandar, 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 Sanchin. Sandar, yeah, yeah, and and there were towers there, mm -hmm. um, and this seems that this seems to be a callback to that of. Um, The 13 Black Towers. Um, I don't know if that's supposed to... Uh, 74. Um, the, I, I, I do feel like I have heard... Wasn't it 13 Malkir? Um, I don't know if there were a specific number tied to that. Hmm. I, I do believe that I have read an interpretation of this dream being the black towers are the ch are the forsaken because mm. there were originally 13 um, and one collapsed, but then regrew tallest of all. Um, and yeah, then that six would be towers remain yeah. looming ab above her. So are there uh, are there are there six forsaken left at this point? Uh, let's see, Grindel, Morden, Sindane, uh, Demandred, 
Masana. Masana. Is there any? There's a oh, Rhaegar uh, just getting killed. Mulgadian, she's still around. Yeah. Yeah, we haven't seen her in her bit, but she's still around. So, yeah, there's six left. Yep, and uh, Sindane grew back smaller. Should have should have grown back smaller. Morden should be the bigger one. I would assume so because he was defeated, um, and killed, but now he's 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 back. He's and, bliss. <laughs> and stronger than ever. Yeah. All right, that was just a random aside, really. Um, the, I mean, the main point of this chapter is is. Ran strolling into the White Tower and saying, "Hi, I'm the Dragon Reborn. I'd like to talk to the Amarillan, please." I just grew some apples. Yeah, some big old apples to waltz on in like this. Um, I really appreciate the interaction between Rand and Sawan. Um, I think it's. I think it is. It, it is great characterization for both of them. Um, and, and this is one of those times that I may have been thinking about when I, when I said that, that this book, my recollection of this book was that it was hit or miss. Cause this is a hit to me is that I think Sanderson gets both of these characters, right? Um, three really, cause Brian is there for a bit too. And, and he, I think he does Sawan and, and Gareth pretty well. Um, but but both both old and new rand you know the uh i think that's something sanderson actually does to his credit is that the there had to be you know it couldn't have been easy to uh to write this new rand because he has to be new quote unquote but but not because he still ran, he's still the same guy, he's just whole now. It's as he says here in this chapter, it's, I remember it all, it's, it's like a dream, but I know that it's, but it's part of me. So I, I remember that life as if it were a dream, but I know that that is me. Not was me, is me. So, a word, dream. Remember yeah. the hub, the metaphysical hub. Yeah. Um, and, and uh, Swan even notes that his eyes are different. So Gwen notes that too when she looks at him, is that there's a depth to his eyes now. So it couldn't have been easy to to still write Rand, but yet show that transformation and 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 have it land. And, and I think this is one of the elements that that Sanderson really stuck the landing was was new Rand. Uh, and th these are some of my favorite parts of this book are the Rand moments. Um, you know, as, as we go on and I, I continue to pick at things, it may turn out that those are my, the only parts of this book that I like. We'll see as we <laughs> continue on. Um, there's also, a, I think, a, a redeeming moment here for Egwene. Um, uh, oh but no before we move on but but part speaking of redeeming moments uh i i like that rand is pulling on my name is earl uh great show loads of laughs uh but that that he goes up to sawan not just for you know what is she like what is a gwen the amarillan like but also I never thank you for taking an arrow for me. And, and so I love Sawan's response of, yeah, well, I didn't, it wasn't exactly on purpose. He says, no, but you still <laughs> took it. So thank you. So I, I, I love that he, he, my name is Earl's it there. And, and I, I enjoy that exchange between the two of them for what it says about them and what it says about Egwene. Um, speaking of Egwene, I, I do think we get a, a bit of a redemptive moment here. It's just, not it, it's blunted by the fact of how she's still acting like i said with the dream of well hold on shouldn't you have a bit of more of a nuanced 
approach here because you just had this dream and the dream at least to me seems to imply that he needs to break the seals and you are immediately i don't know that antagonistic is the right word but but you're you're immediately very set in your belief that absolutely not you cannot do this rather than a oh i don't think that's a good idea tell me why mm -hmm. you know this this doesn't make any sense to me um but before before we get to that uh page 84 um Egwene leaned forward studying him there didn't seem to be madness in his eyes she knew those eyes she knew rand light she thought i'm wrong i can't think of him only as the dragon reborn I'm here for a reason. He's here for a reason. To me, he must be Rand because Rand can be trusted while the Dragon Reborn must be feared. Um, Which are you? She whispered unconsciously. He heard. I am both, Egwene. I remember him, Luce Theron. I can see his entire life, every desperate moment. I see it like a dream, but a clear dream. My own dream. It's part of me. Um, I, I like the, what seems to me is, is Egwene reconciling with Rand in her own mind. Because one of our big criticisms of Egwene has always been, you should know better than anyone who Rand the man is. And yet, you're always thinking the worst of him. And treating him accordingly. I'm going to use different words. You're always trying to control him. Well, but the controlling comes from this projection, this this failed cross sex mind reading, where she she assumes the worst in in Rand's intentions. Therefore, the actions that she doesn't like are more than just wrong; they're bad. You know possibly even evil uh, e e even when you know he is not in fact he is quite the opposite of that you also know the kinds of struggles he's had to go through and and that moment there of no stop everyone is seeing the dragon reborn but there must be a reason I believe in the pattern and we we me and him former friends former almost betrothed you know grew up in the same small village together there is a reason that it's me and him sitting here right now and i can't forget that so to me that was a bit of a redemptive moment for her when it comes to her and rand and that relationship uh i don't think it's executed very well after the fact but mm -hmm. it, it it it's still pretty good I mean, and then ultimately she does say, I give you leave to go. Um, now she admits, I don't think I could have. I I don't know how, but I just feel that somehow if I'd have said, no, you can't go, he, he would have gone. That somehow we wouldn't have been able to stop him. And she gets a, an, a bit of an insight into how once Rand leaves and the others start talking about that overwhelming, oppressive sense of, of awe that kept them from speaking, let alone doing anything. So I, I think that was, that was, uh, th that's there to, to point out, oh yeah, she's right. Yeah. You wouldn't have been able to stop him. You know, the, the pattern would not have let you or however you want to look at it, that if, if you'd said no, he would have said, okay, well, sorry, but I got to go anyway. And he would have just gone mm -hmm. and, and no one would have been able to stop him. And not only because he's, uh, so powerful but because they as they admitted they were just starstruck yeah the whole time i mean it was Tavarin stuff but if she had said shield him now they would have been just like oh. <laughs> yeah all right chapter four we've already kind of touched on this in talking about perrin and the parent and the wolf 
of of um but basically uh <clears throat> Hopper the mentor on page 91 uh it seems to me that Hopper is explaining here why zebras don't get ulcers or mm -hmm. wolves is that worry 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 uh Uh, da, da, da. Yes. Uh, these things you think. How can you think such images of nothing? You are young bull. You will always be young bull. How can you lose young bull? Look down and you will see his paws beneath. Bite in his teeth will kill. There is nothing. There is no losing this. Um, and he, he keeps telling me this. Uh, yeah, there it is, down at the very bottom. Uh, dangerous for tomorrow. Ignore them for now. Worry is for two legs. Uh, and then building on that uh, is... All right, so page 95 is the scene where Hopper has to stop Perrin from killing the stag which he he re reiterates we're in the dream world death means death here death means the end mm -hmm. and uh and, and and hopper is basically pointing out hey you keep saying i got to stay away from the wolf but all us wolves are here sitting at the edge panting going good hunt high five job well done guys and and we were done you were the one that kept going um but down at the bottom of page 95 is is uh this is as much as the parent part of it is frustrating the hopper part of it is pretty good it's pretty well written i think in in his in, in both the the other otherness of of trying to make sense of an animal's mind but then mm -hmm. also the wisdom of it of uh that parent finally said is what i fear no you do not fear it hopper sent you're telling me what i feel you do not smell afraid hopper sent parent lay back staring up at the branches above i worry about it then Worry is not the same as fear. Why say one and feel the other? Worry, worry, worry. It is all that you do. It is one of the things that is, but it, I hate, I always, uh, feel like I need a disclaimer that there are no negative emotions. It's just how they're used. Worry is a survival tool because we as humans can anticipate danger, whereas animals do struggle with that. Uh, so we can we can see a, a field of tall grass and immediately think, probably snakes in there. Good idea if I wear my boots today. That's survival. Snakes in there. I'm going to have nightmares about snakes for five weeks. That's a phobia. Yeah. So the, 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 yeah, we, it is something that makes us human. We do do it well, but we kind of overdo it. And, and Perrin here is way off the mark because not only is he overdoing it, but he can't even see why, because he's not putting the right name on the right thing. Mm-hmm. You know, it's it's not fear. It's worry. It's, you know, you brought up a while ago. It's not anger. It's frustration. And and if you just think, oh, why am I so angry all the time? Because you're so frustrated all the time. If you can't find the right word, if you're not properly analyzing that emotion and understanding it, then you're not going to be able to live with it. And that's that's ultimately what Hopper is trying to teach. Perrin thinks he needs to learn the wolf dream and what he needs to learn is himself. Mm -hmm. well and that's that's the thing if if he understood it 
like he thinks he understands becoming the wolf, he wouldn't be afraid of it. Mm -hmm. Because the wolf just is. That's what Hopper keeps trying to tell him. Well, yeah, I'm just a wolf. I don't have to worry about becoming something I don't like because I just am. Mm -hmm. I, I like the, your, your point about how, how Galad is already there and that he is more wolf-like. And we get that here because we're going to switch to Galad's point of view again. And we get that with the way he thinks about and evaluates um, uh, this this caravan, which is is Basil Gill and the other people that ran or that Perrin had sent on ahead of him. Um, and, and you get that in part with the uh, um, with Buyer and his, you know, we took the gar dark friends into custody. How do you know they're dark friends? because okay that's the the way he so patiently gala deals with child buyer and his zealotry is uh it's it's amusing on the surface level but it's also very insightful about gala's character well and, it, this is this is a speech he wrote well here we must tread carefully. In the past, the boldness and perhaps over-eagerness of the children has alienated those who should have been our allies. Mm -hmm. There you go. That's the whole problem with the children of light. It's not what they actually believe. It's how they go about it. And then the, the very last page uh, of the chapter, page 102, I like because it's, it's setting up, you know, and, and this is what jumped out at me earlier when I made the point about Galad and Perrin and uh, and Galad and Gawain uh, but here your you know Perrin golden eyes never heard of him should I yes Bornhold said he killed my father and so you know you're you're left with that dun 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 moment and what's being set up here is the kind of um animus of Gawain versus Rand, but Galad versus Perrin is going to end up very differently because Galad is a better person. And, the, and that's why I wanted to you know make sure to point out the the nuance and the maturity of how Galad is thinking about Rand, the Dragon Reborn, versus the way Gawain continues to. I would. I just want me and him and a sword. I was like, dude, stop it, just stop it. I mean, we're about to get to that here in chapter five. Is is Gawain, and can we just blow past this one? You know, he he even thinks, you know, he even thinks to himself, "Hey, dummy, he just rip you apart with the one power before you ever cross swords." So he, he's not even listening to himself. So he he's letting the immature brat he is purposely letting the immature brat be in control because there is a part of him that knows better and that's to me i think was so frustrating about gawain and the more i think yeah he's supposed to be that way he's he's not supposed to be likable you're supposed to like him at first and then realize oh he's he's actually kind of a disappointment um and there there's a there's an element of that here in this this uh, investigation because it, it opens it up. It opens up with Gawain and Sleet um, investigating these the, the string of murders of Aes Sedai and and Egwene and the other sisters are convinced that it's the Black Ajah. Uh and Gawain is trying to not just trying to help, but trying to prove himself to Egwene. Um, that, but but the, the part I wanted to point, hone in on, it, it, is towards the end here of this investigation, the way he deals with, with Chubain, the, the leader of the Tower Guard, versus the way he deals with Egwene. Because that, to me... Uh, it struck me as interesting that 
one, he read Shubain properly. He, he th This guy isn't just being a jerk. He thinks I'm trying to take his place. He, he thinks, one, um, I'm an upstart. Two, uh, as far as he knows, I'm one of Gareth Bryan's guys. And three, he thinks I'm trying to take his place. Mm -hmm. Let me very cleverly and subtly deal with that. I'm going to take him aside and I'm going to not answer that directly because you can't deal with people that way. I'm not just going to say, hey, I'm not coming for your job. Chill out because that's mm -hmm. not how you chill someone out. He, I'm going to demonstrate to him that that's not what I care about. That's not what I'm here for. Uh, by by thanking him for helping me reconcile myself with Egwene because I desperately want to be her warder. That that's what I'm doing here. And um, one of the interesting bits to it to me and why the, I, th I think I mentioned this way back in Lord of Chaos when uh, when they were canoodling with each other uh, in Karheen is that the the where Gawain and Egwene could have been interesting is that it is a kind of a double subversion of tropes because you have you have the commoner and the prince mm -hmm. okay except then it gets turned on its head because Egwene ends up being the one on top and. Gawain ends up kind of falling from his position or falling from grace, if you will. Because it's he didn't just... go do his job. Yeah, the frustration, though, is that then he never really has a redemptive arc and and Egwene and Gawain never really have a... They never really have an arc, period, as far as I... I mean, we'll we'll get more into that here with with as they go back and forth. Um with Egwene trying to get Gawain to to realize the position he's putting her in. Um, but um, the other interesting thing to me is, is this purposefully or accidentally an illustration with the difficulty with cross-sex mind reading? Because for whatever reason, and and perhaps it is just a, a gender bias thing, is he can't see how to do that with Egwene. With another guy, he goes, oh, I see the problem here, and I know how to fix it. But he is terminally incapable of doing that with Egwene. And is that just because of the cross-sex mind reading? Is it because he's so wrapped up in his own emotion about how he feels for Egwene, or is it because he's a moron? Well, you did because of he, because of he, because of he three times, but also there is a because of she, because she is a bitch about it. Very Respect true. my authority. Yeah, she very much is is in that realm right now. No, that that is a good point because when he does go to her, he makes some good points that she absolutely does not concede. Of hey, look, yeah, I know you keep telling me that, but we are in private right now, and you do need someone who can who can talk to you about these things in private you need someone who can challenge your assumptions right i don't want to challenge your authority but you do need someone to challenge your assumptions yeah and that, that that's the problem here is yeah he's having trouble accepting her position or whatever but also he's he is trying to separate private from public and she won't even let him do that yeah yeah that is her big failing too. And, and, and why it never feels like there's any sort of resolution here is because, you know, you know, from his she, point, she's of view, basically in her words are saying, look, yeah, you can talk to me like that, but you have to have my express permission to do so. Even when yeah, we're in private. Yeah. <laughs> That's, that is kind of what she's saying. It's like, you, it's you have to have like, my permission and you have to do it the way I want. Yeah, pretty much. We call that henpecked, by the way. Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, there it is on page one thirteen. Uh, he ha even has this thought that Hamar had taught him that, and that 
thinking that had thinking that had to hurt because it always hurts when he thinks about how he killed Hamar, who was his teacher, and he was the warder of warders. He was the teacher of would be warders, and he taught me. I'm supposed to challenge. I want to be your warder. Well, okay, I'm technically not yet, but by golly, I intend to be. And it's my job, it's my duty to challenge you in private. Um, Even, again... Gawain is. I'm, I'm, I hate that I'm defending him here, mm-hmm. but she admits out loud, "No, it's not madness; it's desperation." And he's like, "That's why I'm here. We're in a desperate moment. Use yeah. every tool you have." Yeah. Yeah. Well, and he he does bring up a good point that she actually does concede to, which is the, you know, cause we, we very briefly switched to her point of view after he leaves and she does have the thought of, all right, that is a good point. I can't order Aes Sedai to take orders, but I, I do need to strongly encourage any Aes Sedai without one to find one because it is, it is, imperative it, you know it is it is a tool that we have to fight the shadow and we should all be using all of these tools um, well but but there's a simpler resolution to that armed guards from the water training they don't have to be bonded your water they could just be sitting outside your door 24 7 yeah um there's also a, another element of, hey, uh, what's the common denominator here? Um, because her the first couple of paragraphs there where she's, she's sighing and she's trying to figure out why it's so hard to keep her emotions in check. It's and it, it when I when I reread that section, it kind of dawned on me. Oh, you mean the 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 way you act with Rand too? <laughs> Because in a lot of ways, the way she's treating Gawain is exactly how she treats Rand. It's just Rand doesn't have to put up with it, and he won't, and he doesn't. Mm-hmm. But in a, in basically what she's admitting is that I'm constantly butting heads with Rand because I'm very emotional around him, and I I can't I can't as much as I put on the facade of I said I sereneness, I'm not actually serene. And so I keep butting heads with him. That's why, you know, she's she's thinking about Gawain here, but no, the same thing applies to Rand. So I, I think she's just admitting that I'm always a jerk around Rand because I'm still emotional about him. All right. And then we switch to Grendel, which interesting bit here because um, page 115. Is this where it is? Yeah, so Grendel has this thought here of the best part about being predictable was it allowed you to do the unexpected. I'm wondering was Grendel always the most potent and dangerous of the Forsaken? And did RJ sucker us, the reader, the way she did her rivals and opponents? I always felt she was strong. So I don't know. I can't I, I can't be I'm not in the crowd that might have underestimated her. Hmm. The I mean, one I think has lived too long is Mohedian. I mean, she gets the better of Mord in here. She outfoxes mm-hmm. Ishi. That's a big effing deal. Well, but even as Mord in, and even as Ishi way back, you you get a lot of his blind spots really early on, and that's exactly what she's playing to right now. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, his blind spots are similar to Rand's. 
which is I, I mean I think that's on purpose, obviously, but yeah. That and, and why I'm I'm I I almost wish instead of New Spring as a as a short novel, I almost wish we had gotten an Age of Legends instead, because I would love to have seen Jordan write a short story or a short novel on Luce there and Alon them as friends to show us how they became enemies. Yeah, one you could even include uh I can't remember what Lanfear's name was, but uh because she was his lover, remember? Yeah, yeah. Or Ilyana and then uh uh who was also in the mix. Demandred was always around because he was always second. Uh, so you get this whole it, it it would be like the the teen angst version of the X-Men, you know, though before they were famous, this is how they mm -hmm. all were. Mm -hmm. You know, a show that, that that's, that is a lot like that. I don't know if I, 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 I doubt that it was drawn from this, but watch the, uh, the boys and the superhero versions of those. And then the, the V is the prequel to that. And you get kind of the teen angst version of all of that. Mm. That would that would be what it's kind of like, I think. All right, last chapter, chapter six. We switch back to Perrin, although it's from Morgase's point of view. But what I like about it, um, be, because we we mentioned that Morgase gets kind of annoying there for a bit, um, but then then she actually has a redemptive arc and it's it's here in this chapter uh as we get her thoughts as she's moving around serving tea um and she has this thought on page 123 that all she wants now is stability um and that that jumped out at me um, because it's in such such sharp contrast with Elaine. Morgase was humbled severely, but she has actually learned humility. And 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 I think we pointed this out a little bit in in the chapters where they are, um, yeah, because we mentioned we. The the uh, I think the the capture by the Shido would have been better if it wouldn't have always been from Fayil's point of view, and we would have gotten some of these other points of view from some of these other women. But you do see there that Morgase really comes into her own, and I I think it's because of that. I think that was RJ showing us that this powerful woman had been greatly humbled, but more importantly, she had actually learned humility and learned how to use it, learned how to embrace it, how to, how to use it to make herself a better. And so she's one of the ones that is one of the driving forces there that holds them all together and keeps, keeps them from cracking individually and as a group under the strain of that Shido captivity. And, and I think you see from her point of view here how she was able to do that and why she was able to do that. Because she, no, she hasn't completely forgotten that she is Morgay's track and once queen of Andor. And there are those moments, and we do have some of those moments in this chapter where she has these thoughts of these queenly thoughts, and she has to tell herself, that's not who I am anymore. But you get the sense that she genuinely means it when she says it, that she's not just reciting a line to herself to, to try and convince herself that no, the, 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 the humble servant who just wants stability now and just wants to help as best she can, where she can, that's who she is. And that the, the small part of her, that that wants to jump in and give advice that wants to manipulate that wants to you know be the one moving the pieces that's the old part of her 
that's never going to completely go away, but this is who she is. Um, and you, you, you do get that moment uh, later when, when she actually speaks up and says, uh, let me get you some advice, young man, because you're still new at this. <laughs> there are some things that you should just never step into. And just telling someone they're going to get married, that would be very high on that list. <laughs> Especially without at least consulting with your wife. Um, uh, but before we can get there, we do have to have the, I referenced it, the very annoying moment where he he has Will come in with the banner and says, burn it, burn all of them. Mm -hmm. Ugh. Stop. I thought we were done with the grind and we're back to the grind. Yeah, it's there's unwillingness and then there's denial. We've hit the stage mm -hmm. of denial. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. But that is. But again, it's control. I don't want this life, so I'm going to try to make it happen. Instead of this is my life. Let me make the yeah. best of it. Yeah. Yeah. And again, the frustration with Perrin is he has already learned this lesson. He already knows better. He learned this back in book frickin' four. Why 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 are we still here on book 13? Mm -hmm. All right. Well, that was all I had for today. Um, so we'll start with chapter seven next time, which I think we're getting close to having some more. Yeah. Yeah, we finally get to Matt, back to Matt in chapter eight. So we'll Sweet. uh oh we'll have thoughts there for sure. All right, were there any comments we needed to get to? Uh there were no comments from the last time. Okay. So it is uh I don't know. Do we have plans for next Wednesday? I don't even know. I'm sure sure I'm sure something will come up. Something annoying. Oh well I, I had the uh I, I, uh, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Everything is awful and we're all doomed, and it's all Richard Dawkins' fault. <laughs> looks like, looks, looks like I'm going to be listening to a lot of episodes of Poetry of Reality in the next week after uh, I finish my papers. I've got two more papers to disseminate by midnight tonight, and it's my own fault because I got sucked into Baldur's Gate all night last night, and I usually have two papers done by thursday night and i had none so i finished one earlier while we were waiting and i have two more to get done so yeah oh. well enjoy it while it lasts because hasbro and or wizards of the coast are awful and they have completely alienated the studio that did Baldur's gate 3 and that's why the studio has said there will be no more dlc we are why? done with there Baldur's was gate 3. there was plenty there was plenty of woke stuff thrown in there to make people happy I don't know, but for whatever reason, that that you you can tell from every video I've ever seen of the head of that studio that this was a passion project, and they deeply cared about this this game and the source material and and, and the everything that goes along with it, and and now that they've said we're there will be no more Baldur's Gate three content, and we're not working on a Baldur's Gate four, we're moving on to other things. Well, I was playing this to hold me over till. Uh the newest dragon age. So hopefully they stick with their guns because that's an excellent, uh, series, but no, it's good. The only thing I don't like is the camera on the console. It's not the normal inverted camera where you can go all over. It only zooms in and then up like that. And it throws a lot of things off. But other than that, the game, the, the, the game itself is fine. The, it's, it's turn-based, which is fun. So, but it's 3D turn based. So it's kind of, it's kind of, it's like a, it's a really high tech Final Fantasy tactics in a lot of ways. Yeah. So that's pretty cool. But yeah, no, it's, it's good enough. I just can't get distracted and play six hours of it. But no, I, this is how mindless you get. I normally go to bed at exactly 10 30 every night. And I just kind of got sucked in, even though I had homework to do. And I could have been reading some of this to, to get, keep up with it and everything. 
I started playing. It was light outside, and I looked back. It was midnight thirty, <laughs> and I was like, "Holy! I just played for seven hours straight. Did I even take a bathroom break? I don't know." So, well, but if you remember, if you remember all that you were doing, then that's a, the sign of a good game, rather than I don't even remember what I was doing. Well, then you were doom scrolling, and then that's not a good game. No, 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 no. I do remember what I was doing, and I yeah. yeah so, so no, it, it it's good. It's it's one of the better RPGs I've played in a while, uh, which is which is there haven't been any really good ones in a long time. Although, if are you a Fallout fan? I never got into those. Games. I I never got into them either, but I heard the show is horrible. So, and I heard if you've never played the games, you won't understand anything because all the show is is what from this is the review I hear, and I wouldn't know it if I saw it is basically just nuggets for people who played the games. There is no cohesive plot or explanation of what's going on. You would know what's going on if you played all the games, but as a show goes, if you're going to watch it with somebody who's never played the games, you're going to be explaining everything the whole time. Yeah. So that's, that's not a, a good shame show. because it's, it's got that one guy who's in those things and I like, and I can't ever remember his name. The guy who was in the shield and justified and uh, I saw him when I saw the trailer because uh, the Friday night tights or something I was watching and they showed the trailer and were commenting on it. I was like, Oh, Hey, that guy, I know that guy. I like that guy. That's a All shame. Right. Well, we'll hit uh, starting at chapter seven next week and we'll figure out some nihilistic stuff for Wednesday. Uh, everybody have a great weekend. If you're in our part of the, the world, it's going to be nice weather. So enjoy it because if you're also in our part of the world, it's only a month before it'll be 100 degrees and miserable for the rest of the summer. So yep. remember, for everybody that lives in Texas, we're only preheating right now. <laughs> All right. See you all then. See you later.